Good afternoon. Welcome to CUGH virtual satellite session. Um, welcome to the session specifically focusing on global ideas for local challenges, a learning network to advance health equity. We're really delighted um, to have you here with us today. Um, it, I, I was speaking to my colleagues and just sharing with them, this is really a dream come true um, for us to understand how we might be able to bring global ideas to address low health equity here in America. The purpose of this session is to really increase awareness of global learning on health equity models and to introduce you to the new Global Learning for Health Equity Network. Um, we also hope to engage you as global health practitioners, as researchers, as educators, in an interactive exercise this afternoon where all of us could share knowledge and experiences with learning, um, global learning for health equity. We're just really delighted that you took time out of your day to join this session. Next slide, please. So next, we'll um, like to share with you a little bit about what to expect um, for the session and the agenda. Please bear with me for one minute. Great. So first, I'd like to just do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if we could all remain muted. And I also like to just double check um, with attendees to make sure that you're seeing the slides. I see, oh, thank you, Linda, for saying now you're able to see the slides. Um, so the agenda for today, um, we'll begin today with um, a talk from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on Blue Marble Thinking. Um, from 1.15 to 1.30, um, Virginia Rawthorne and myself will introduce you to the Global, Health, Global Learning Health Equity Network. Um, we'll also have some interactive exercises. Um, in the middle of the day, we're really excited to be able to share with you um, five global learning projects. Um, so you'll get to hear a little bit about some researchers and program implementers in the field that are engaged in global learning to advance health equity. Um, we'll have an opportunity for you to have Q&A with the panelists. Um, and then the afternoon, we'll have breakout sessions where we'll have some interactive ex exercises. So we're just really happy to have you here. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you. And I would like to introduce our first speaker. We're delighted to have Karobi Acharya, who directs the Global Ideas for U.S. Solutions portfolio at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. This portfolio draws inspiration from how other countries are advancing health equity and well being for all members of the society. It also identifies the best practices in order to adapt them and to improve health and well being in the United States. Karobi is a public health anthropologist and she has worked over 20 years on international health and development issues in over 10 countries. Previously, she was the global director for Ashoka a network of social entrepreneurs worldwide where she led Ashoka's efforts to document the system changes that Ashoka fellows achieve. Prior to Ashoka, she worked for the Academy of Educational Development where she worked to bring community voices and perspectives into policy and program design. She was also on faculty at the Johns Hopkins University School of, Public, School of Hygiene and Public Health. Karobi holds a Doctor of Science degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health and is a Donella Meadows Leadership Fellow. 
She enjoys crossing boundaries, both conceptually and geographically, and practices on what we call blue marble thinking every day. Um, with that, I'll hand over and thank you so much and welcome uh, Karobi to our session. Thank you so much, Yolanda, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It, it's it's great to to be with you virtually. Um, so I'm excited to be um, to be with you today. Um, we're going to be taking a quiz together. I, I feel a little like a school teacher, um, but don't be nervous. We will be grading on a curve. Um, but before diving into the quiz, I wanted to give you a little context into how it fits into our work. Um, next slide, please. So at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we work alongside others to build a culture of health, providing everyone in America with a fair and just opportunity for health and well-being. We know that to help everyone in our nation have the opportunity to live the healthiest life possible, that we need the best ideas that the world has to offer. Next slide, please. To this end, our Global Ideas for U.S. Solutions team supports organizations to uncover ideas and solutions from beyond our borders and to learn from programs, policies, and practices that have worked in other countries and open up our imaginations to new possibilities in the U.S. Next slide. We also recognize that there is a huge opportunity for others to follow suit and discover the value of global learning in their own work. So a recent survey of US foundations that was done by Candid showed that 73% of respondents reported that their domestic grant making were rarely or not at all informed or inspired by ideas beyond the US borders. So rather than telling people that global learning is valuable, we wanted to create a simple tool for people to reflect on their own experiences and discover for themselves how their exposure to the rest of the world might influence their thinking. Next slide, please. So how many of you are familiar with this photograph? It was taken in 1972 by the crew of Apollo 17, the last lunar landing mission. It's called the Blue Marble. And seeing the world from afar for the first time shifted both the astronauts and our own perspective in profound ways, revealing the many connections that we can see when we take a step back from our home. Similarly, when we leave our country, either literally or these days more often figuratively, we can look back and see our home, our work, our challenges and our potential solutions with new eyes. And we've come to call that work blue marble thinking. So just to give you an example, about five years ago, I went to Cuba as part of a study tour with Medic. Uh, many of you will know that Cuba has a lower infant mortality rate and higher life expectancy than the US. And we thought they must be doing something right. Oh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, Cuba uses every resource they have when it comes to health. We visited a park that was being used by a school for PE. It was used by pregnant women for an exercise class and by this group of women in their 70s for Tai Chi. And this hit a chord with one of the Americans in the group uh, who worked in a hospital. She said, you know, there's a park right next to my hospital and I've got a friend who's a Zumba teacher. The Americans on the study tour all worked in very under-resourced parts of the US. And they came away saying that they would never complain about a lack of resources again, once they saw how little the Cubans were doing. I mean, sorry, how much the Cubans were doing with so little. And I kept wondering, why did we have to go all the way to Cuba for this woman to quote, see the park that was right next door. To really, why did we have to go to Cuba for her to see the connection between the park and the hospital? And so that, that story to me is an example of blue marble thinking. Next slide, please. So inspired by this idea, we created the blue marble quiz. It's a simple 12 question quiz that 
allows people to step away from their day-to-day -day experiences and reflect on how they may or may not experience the rest of the world and then how that might influence their own thinking and where they look for good ideas. Uh, this isn't a scientific survey, but the questions in the quiz are meant to encourage reflection and they're very much informed by resources and research that speak to the benefits of looking abroad for inspiration and ideas. So I know you received the quiz uh, yesterday, I think, and maybe some of you took it, others may not have, but um, to get you on the same page, I wanted to just uh, take a minute to walk through the quiz so you can see how it works. So this is a, a video. So there are 12 questions in two sets, uh, some about your experience and some about your how you think. So the first set is your experiences, where you grew up and, and um, recognizing that not everyone might have access to the same experiences. So the first question, how are you connected to various countries and cultures? Really just thinking about, um, you know, you grow, this person knows a lot about their ancestors and where they lived um, and that they've got family who lived in another country. Um, how many people from different countries or cultures do you have close ties to? For this person, it's, it's quite a few. Um, and how many countries have you visited? Again, the, the, this, there's no judgment here. This is just about your own experience. And then once you get to a country, what do you do? What kinds of experiences do you have? My personal favorite is to go to a local grocery store, uh, but do you go to parks and playgrounds, sporting events? Do you eat the local food? What is your experience once you are in that country? And then as we all know, you know, traveling to a new country doesn't have to get, doesn't mean you have to get on a plane um, and thank goodness for that these days. So what are the other ways in which you learn about countries, whether music or food or doing research, watching movies, things like that. And then where do you get your news? Uh, how often are you uh, learning about other countries through the news? So now this next set of questions is really around your thinking um, and how your thinking uh, influences where you look for solutions. So really interesting question. Are you more similar to someone from your own country with a different income or someone in, from a different country with a similar income? Um, it's, a, I think, a fascinating question. And then what are, what are some of your kind of knowledge about the world. Um, some of these sort of big, big ideas. What do you what do you think? And then how do you think about other countries? So, you know, does where an idea or a product come from, does that affect how you assess its quality or its value to you? Uh, does it make a difference where things come from? And then where does your vision of the future come from? You know, is it from science fiction, technology, or does your vision from the future come from other countries in part? Here's the blue marble again. What do you, what's your starting point? Do you look for your own country? Do you look at the whole thing overall? Um, how, do you, how do you start with this photo? Um, and then you're, you get a chance to predict what do you think your response will be? There are four categories. Um, how, how much are you thinking and, um, and learning globally? And you get a chance to predict what you think your response will be. Oops. So this person is predicting that they are blue marble all the way. And in fact, that is the way their answers did, did come up that they are blue marble all the way. So that matches. 
Um, and then what we do is we go into sort of all of the possible, there are four possible results and you get a chance to kind of look at that. Again, this is very much trying to acknowledge different places where people are. It's not intended to be judgmental at all. Um, and then we share a bit about why we ask the different questions and provide some resources. Um, so for example, on how many countries you visited, we reference Adam Galinsky's work on uh, the benefits of living abroad. Um, so there are some fun things like Radio Garden, which uh, allows you to listen to radio uh, from anywhere in the world. Um, then uh, this is, uh, this is about different income levels. Dollar Street is a really cool platform that looks at different income levels across the world and sort of the material goods of different families at different income levels across the world. And then in terms of your perceptions of the world, uh, a couple of the resources are two really cool TED Talks, one by Hans Rosling, and then my all-time favorite TED Talk by Chimananda Adichie around the danger of a single story. And um, yeah, so there's lots of resources. And then, um, you know, after you take the quiz, we encourage you to, to get engaged with some of the RWJF work. We have a webinar series. Um, we would love to hear uh, how you might use it. Um, about 3,000 people have taken the quiz so far. Um, so um, would love to kind of think about how you might use it. I think you can go to the next slide. So I, I don't think we have time for questions now, but happy to, if you have things in, you can put things in the chat or contact me later. And um, yeah, just really um, encourage you to um, think about, you can go to the next slide, sorry. <laughs> um, to think about whether you, you see an opportunity to use this in your own organization or meetings or classrooms or things like that. Um, and you can email us at bluemarblequiz at rwjf.org. Um, so thanks so much. And with that, I'll turn it back to Yolanda and Virginia. Thank you so much, uh, Karobi. Um, I've been so impressed with the, well, the Blue Marble thinking in general, but all the resources that you added to that page. And um, so many were have been very influential on my thinking. So thank you very much for that and, and for sharing your time with us today. Um, I just want to wish a good afternoon to everyone. I'm Virginia Rothorn. I'm a global health lawyer by training and an associate professor at the University of Maryland Graduate School. And I direct the University of Maryland Baltimore Center for Global Engagement. For many years, I have worked with global health colleagues, some of whom are here, I can see, um, to try and understand the historical orientation against reaching outside of US borders for promising health-related interventions. And when someone overcomes that orientation and does identify a promising intervention, I have studied the barriers to adapting interventions for use in the United States. So most of my research has been around overcoming legal and regulatory barriers to reverse innovation. And on the education side, thinking about how to foster an orientation in students that will encourage them to pursue global learning in their future careers. So for this reason, I'm so honored to be working with my colleague, Dr. Yolanda Obalu, colleagues that you'll be hearing from soon, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to create a global learning for health equity network and, and a, a network and framework to support global learning for health equity. We wanted to take a few minutes to tell you about this project, and I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of the context, sort of the what and the why, and then Yolanda will follow up with the how. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I do um, want to clarify from the outset that um, we're using this concept of global learning uh, because it's used in similar but different ways across educational and, and global health uh, circles. It's also, of course, called global local, global to local, and that somewhat awkward term, global. 
Um, but I wanted to just clarify some of these definitions and tell you the, term, the definition we're using. So in higher education, especially in the education abroad and the service learning context, um, global learning is has one set of meanings and, and they it's often, they use this definition of the process of diverse people collaboratively analyzing and addressing complex problems that transcend borders. Then in global health education, and you see my name after this, I, I gathered a, a lot of people, some here today, to talk about what uh, global learning was in the global health education context. And we developed this definition, teaching a global perspective or understanding of transnational health issues, determinants and solutions, and applying them to a healthcare problem at the local US level. In the research and implementation science, you can, you, a common definition is the translation of interventions and programs developed outside the US um, for adoption, adaptation, and implementation within US communities. But the definition that we're using or the concept of global learning that we're using in our project is, is specifically to advance equity. And the way we're thinking of it is looking at examples of how global, global counterparts are tackling equity in a variety of areas that affect health and well being, and asking questions such as what programs have worked uh, in other countries, how are they evaluated, and how could they be adapted for use in the US to achieve health equity? Next slide, please. And, and just to get everyone on the same footing, um, I wanted to share the definition of health equity we're using and, um, and to state that um, this is, this is, there are multiple definitions, but this is one that really resonates with us. Health, health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences. This is a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation definition. Um, a few years ago, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation convened global learning leaders to a design pro to take part in a design process to consider what a global learning for health equity network and framework would look like. This graphic from that meeting is very helpful to put our work in context. As represented here, we know that health equity, or really better said, health inequity, is a complex and extensive problem. And as it says here, we've got a long way to go. And global learning is one tool in the toolbox to address health equity in the United States. And our network and our efforts are one effort within the global learning um, scope that people are embracing in different ways for different things. And so we, we wanna acknowledge that our network is part of this bigger, um, excuse me, this bigger effort. So on that note, if you'll turn to the next slide, I'll turn it over to um, Yolanda who will share how this is very much a group effort and how we're working toward um, creating the framework. So as part of the first Global Learning for Health Equity Network, um, we engaged many of the individuals that were part of the Global Network Design Group. Um, and University of Maryland serves as the home institution for the network. But we're really absolutely delighted to have partners from across the nation, um, including the Henry Ford Health System. And you'll hear from our partners um, in the panel session, um, as well as Brigham's Women's Hospital, um, COPE Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment, um, program, as well as Albert Einstein College of Medicine, um, Montefiore, um, Athens City Health Department, um, and BCT Partners. Um, so these are the organizations that are part of the beginning of the network that we really hope to expand over time. So as we began to think about the network um, and how to move along the process, we thought it would be really important to have at least a three-year process. Um, and so we have five different phases that will uh, be carried out over the three-year period. Um, and the first phase is a phase that we call scope broadly. 
Um, and scope broadly really focuses on doing a really broad landscape analysis to really understand what is happening in our community and around the nation as it relates to global learning. Um, in year two, we will reach out to others that are doing global learning um, and we'll go through a phase that's called reflect deeply. In the reflect deeply phase, we will meet and begin to develop what we're calling a global implementation framework, um, which is a toolkit that will help others to begin to do global learning for health equity. Uh, at the end of year two and into year three, we will begin a phase called trial collaboratively. Within the trial collaboratively phase, we will have small grants that we will offer to individuals that are interested um, in beginning or evaluating a global learning uh, project that they've been working on. We hope that we can evaluate continuously from the scope broadly, reflect deeply, and trial collaboratively phases. Um, and we do plan to disseminate widely. Um, and today's event is an example of our plan to have a continuous dissemination process. Next, please. In the scope broadly phase, um, we'll have two components. One is to do a scoping review, and the other one is to focus on the five learning communities um, to do an analysis of their context and their activities to better understand global learning. In the scope re scoping review process, we've been using the terms that you see listed here um, from global learning to bidirectional learning to reciprocal learning. Um, and we've been searching not only article databases, but also the gray literature, um, as well as considering other fields that we believe do intersect with global learning, dissemination science, looking at WHO and other major reports, as well as multi-country and comparative country reports. So we're really excited and would welcome more information about from you today in terms of additional terms that you might be interested in adding to the scoping review. For the scope broadly phase, um, we're using an implementation science approach um, to really better understand the intervention characteristics, the social political context of both the inner and outer setting, not only at the originator site, but to the extent that we can at the um, destination, um, not only at the destination site, but also at the originator site. We really hope to learn kind of what really drives global learning under what conditions um, and what types of interventions work well. Um, we will be able to share more information specifically about the strategies, both at the originator site and the destination site, um, including community engagement strategies. One thing we know about global learning is we find an intervention at a global place and we will adopt and adapt that strategy. Um, but at the same time, there's also some bi-directional learning. Um, one of the things that's been really interesting and we'll talk about later is that global learning not only benefits the destination site, sometimes they also benefit the originator site. In terms of outcomes, we would like to understand better what outcomes have been measured, um, specifically health equity measures. Um, we do know that there are many studies that measure acceptability and feasibility. Um, but we're interested in learning if others have gone even further to measure effectiveness and reach. Um, and so we hope to be able to capture some of this knowledge about global learning as we move forward with the network. Next slide, please. And reflect deeply. We hope that some of you that are available today will consider to come and join us as we reflect on previous global learning projects, some that are just in the exploratory phase, um, some that are ready for scale up. Um, we will select learning communities to join the network and to help us pilot test the global implementation framework that we will develop um, based on what we learn and scope deeply and reflect um, reflect deeply. We will host an international convening of global learnings, learners so that we can work collaboratively together to develop 
the implementation framework, which we're calling a toolkit that someone could pick up and say, this is how to do global learning. Next, please. Um, we will support um, multiple nine-month um, global learning for health equity pilot projects in year three um, to test the acceptability and feasibility of the framework. And as I mentioned earlier, we will evaluate continuously. Um, we seek to, ev uh, to evaluate using common implementation science measures, as well as health equity measures and global learning measures and continue to disseminate. So thank you so much. And we look forward to you participating in the next part of um, our, our session today, where we'll engage in an interactive global learning exercise with Dr. Stephen Thomas, who's a co-investigator from University of Maryland College Park. Hello, global learners. <laughs> Dr. Yolanda, can you uh, hear me okay? Yes, I can. And I'm still working on this technology here. <clears throat> and so if um, our tech person can um, put the question up, if it may be the next slide. And behind the scenes audience, I have some young scholars who are working with me and they're gonna help us build this cloud. So here's the question. What word best define global learning? Now, we're gonna open this up. You can just put as many words in as you like, but just one word at a time. So Mr. Chinadu, I want you to unmic yourself and say hello, if you can hear me. Hello. Very good. You wanna give any instructions? Yeah, so I just put a link into the chat. Everyone's going to go to that link. Um, and once you click on it, it'll take you to a page with the question and you'll just fill in uh, the question box. And again, as many words, just one word at a time and go ahead and begin. And I believe somebody's gonna share the screen so that we can, it says uh, you need to sign in. You can just be a guest. Don't worry about that. You don't even have to put your name. You can skip. Yeah. And if somebody could share screen so we could actually see it build, is that going to happen? Shouldn't it do on your screen? Here we yeah, go. Yeah, I'll share my screen now. Here come the Hollywood squares. It's so good to see everybody out there. And uh, and so go ahead and keep putting in your words. And uh, Dr. Yolanda, you know, let's talk about just what you're seeing as these words come in. Yeah, I, I love this, the first ones that popped up, openness, collaborative, humility. This is really interesting. And so for the uh, audience out there, again, as many words, just one word at a time. And the larger the word, that means the more people who also said that. So let's keep this going. And uh, Dr. Yolanda, just call on any one of your other speakers and just have them speak to what they see here. Sure. So, um, Sonia Shin, would you unmic and speak to what you're seeing here relative to what we might have expected? Hi there. Yeah, thanks for um, inviting me to, to reflect. Um, first of all, I just see a lot of uh, compassion and humanity. So I feel like, you know, it's a it, my, my, my sense is that we're talking about the relationships um, that um, allow learning to happen um, with global communities as opposed to, you know, necessarily um, like say, you know, um, a, a health measure or um, like a research outcome. So I think that's, you know, just very powerful that um, uh, that's what's standing out to me. <laughs> so keep those words coming, keep those words coming. And you know, what's interesting to me, Dr. Yolanda, is what I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing a lot of negative words. And yet in the United States, whenever you say the word that starts with an S, socialism, uh, as it relates to health, things just completely go off the rails. <laughs> and so when we talk about global learning in other countries with different political systems, I wonder to what extent there's acceptability for transferring that knowledge back and forth bi-directionally like you had in your slide. 
Uh, yeah. and, and yet I don't see that as an issue popping up here. Yeah, no, this is really um, interesting. I would invite um, Virginia and Hirobi to also um, give some feedback on what we're seeing here. Well, I, I would just say that I'm very struck by the, um, the biggest word there, humility, um, which is staying there and then accompanied by um, empathy and respect. And, and I think that really acknowledges how much of global learning is dependent on relationships and on um, understanding that others may know do know how to do something better and that we have to keep that humble mind and approach learning humbly. So that's what's really sticking out to me. And, you know, we had our speaker who gave an example from Cuba and uh, reflected on, we had to come all the way to Cuba to kind of have an aha moment. And Cuba is a very small country, uh, limited resources, and, and people were impressed with what they were accomplishing. So that word humility really matters to not come in as if you know everything, to learn from the people where they are and, um, and have that bi-directional learning. It's slowing down a little bit, Dr. Yolanda. You want to call on one more person? Sure. Um, I mean, there's so many like really great words here. Um, I see um, that people put anti-racist, mm -hmm. um, anti-colonial. Um, and I just wondered if one of those individuals that um, added that word would unmike and just share what they were thinking. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Sharmila. I'm a medical student at Dell Medical School in Austin. And I am, um, I put, I know I put down anti-colonial and anti-racist. And I think that's part, partly just because um, I think global health as it is as a field and global learning as it is as a mechanism has evolved over the years. And I think previously, things might have been done in a way that things had been done in a way that really were that really was unidirectional that really did focus on um, on an us to them wet method and it also perpetuated certain um, stereotypes and social um, just um, social constructs that were that have been put out through just like centuries of colonialism and something that I felt very passionate about is coming into this sphere as a product, I think of globalism myself as multiple generation immigrant um, was to commit to global health as um, and global learning as learning to benefit the health of the entire global community, mm. which I think falls directly against kind of the colonial and um, potentially racist lines that maybe international health had been based upon to some extent beforehand. Absolutely amazing. It's amazing, Dr. Yolanda. Every time we do this exercise, what happens, isn't it? Yes, I, I love the word future and futuristic. I mean, there are so many here. Um, but, you know, humility is really large. It stayed. Uh, and so maybe for the last comment, um, whether it's somebody from our team or somebody in the general audience that typed in humility, if you would just weigh in, we would just love to hear your comment. There's more than one of them out there as big as that word is. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is, uh, my name is Elsie Asian. I'm the one who um, answered humility as one of my words. Um, and I've been working in global health for years now. And I, um, what I see from trainees and well-meaning expats is that sometimes they go in thinking that they are the experts. They have the tools, they have the knowledge, and it's important to practice humility and also practice narrative humility in terms of hearing what the other people um, abroad have to say about their condition because they may not have the expertise or the tools or the technical tools, but they, they have an idea that can be contributed to the greater cause. Oh, Dr. Yolanda, you have no idea how excited I am to hear that explanation of humility because Elsie is one of my fearless young scholars. She's the future 
of public health. And that's what we're producing with the next generation. So with that, Dr. Yolanda, I'm going to turn it back to you uh, to, to bring us back to Hollywood Squares. Thank you for that. And I, I hope, um, Stephen, that you're able to share that wordly with the audience, because I thought that was really powerful. Thank Indeed. you. Indeed. So You'll that. also find that the recording of the conversation that goes with it is something that you can extract out while that cloud is building. So uh, Chinadu will have that. Uh, word cloud for us. And I took a, a, a photo and a screenshot. I'll send that to you immediately. And I uh, just want to thank the audience for their honest uh, assessment and, and, the, and the analysis that came with it. Thank you. And you'll meet some of my other young scholars in the, in the breakout rooms a little bit later. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, and to the, the people that um, shared their reflections. That was really powerful. Um, so um, I am going to quickly introduce the speakers uh, in this lightning presentation um, section who will share their global learning projects. These uh, individuals are all part of the project team and they're um, putting uh, all of these uh, concepts into action with their projects. So I'll just give a brief introduction that doesn't at all do credit to how amazing these um, folks are. So quickly, I'll say that um, Reverend Alex Plum is a public health and health education specialist. He's the director of clinical and social health integration at the Detroit-based Henry Ford Health System. He's also the senior investigator in the Henry Ford Global Health Initiative, where he guides and evaluates Henry Ford's global to local portfolio of programs. Ruth Dudding is a certified health education specialist. She's the director of community health and engagement at the Athens City County Health Department in Southeastern Ohio. The focus of her work is to improve access to healthy food, increase, increase opportunities for physical activity and health and strengthen systems to connect healthcare providers and community lifestyle change programs. Kevin Fiore is the medical director for Montefiore Health Systems, Office of Population and Community Health, and an assistant professor in both pediatrics and family and social medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. His research aims to, re to address health disparities in communities both in the Bronx and abroad, and he is the primary investigator on multiple ongoing implementation research studies in Togo. Carmen George holds a Master of Science degree and is from a small community on the Navajo Reservation called um, Beck Labito. I hope I got that right, Carmen, in New Mexico. Carmen has, an, uh, has been at the Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment COPE project for over six years and serves as the research and MEQ manager. COPE is a nonprofit out of Gallup, New Mexico, that works in close partnership with Brigham and Women's Hospital and Partners in Health. Sonia Shin is a physician and public health advocate and currently associate professor at Harvard Medical School and associate physician of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital and an infectious disease physician at Gallup Medical Center. Her work focuses on health issues among underserved populations in Navajo Nation, and she has worked with Navajo leadership since, since 2009. Um, to strengthen healthcare delivery, and she has served as the founding director of COPE. And of course, my colleague, my dear colleague, Yolanda Obalu will be presenting. She's an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Nursing and chair of the Partnership Professional Education and Practice Department, which includes the Office of Global Health that she helped launch and later directed prior to her current position. Dr. Oblu has 20 years of clinical practice experience in maternal child health as a neonatal nurse practitioner. She was trained by NIH in dissemination and implementation science, and her research seeks global and local solutions for advancing health equity. So on that note, with all these speakers, I'd like to advance to the next slide and, and Dr. Uh, Reverend Alex Plum will take over. Thank you, Virginia. And I think we'll just get the slides through. Perfect. Great. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. And I don't know if I can, if you can move the, um, yeah, if not, we'll just do it like this. That's perfect. 
Okay, uh, wonderful to be with you all uh, today and to talk a little bit about the work we're doing at Henry Ford Health System. I want to start off by telling you about uh, the, uh, the, the work that we're doing in mental health, and particularly I want to talk about Nyaya Health. Uh, which is based in Nepal, based in the Acham district of Western Nepal, very remote rural area um, surrounded by the Himalaya mountains and the, the mountain chain. In the United States, they're known as Possible Health. Um, and they've been working for years to address uh, critical issues around mental health, particularly around individuals who've survived trauma. Um, there's been a very long inter-ethnic war with guerrillas coming across the border um, from different countries. Uh, that's a, an, a, they call it a Maoist insurgency which has inflicted untold um, damage, the loss of countless lives in a lot of the rural parts of Nepal. Additionally, earthquakes and other natural disasters have ravaged many of the communities. And so when you look at the country's uh, infrastructure for mental health, you see a country that really does not have, um, outside of the Kathmandu Valley, an integrated support system to address and to integrate behavioral health into what's already a very patchy, fragmented primary care model. And so Nyaya Health developed a community mental health worker model where they train community health workers in motivational interviewing and in certain modules or modal uh, excuse me, modalities of um, cognitive behavioral therapy to drive behavioral health integration at rural remote and rural primary care health outposts. So we got to know um, Nyaya Health, and I'll talk a little bit about our relationship to them through the work that Henry Ford has led internationally with our global health initiative. Um, but as we got to know them, we, rec we recognized a lot of similarities in terms of disinvestment, history of trauma with the individuals in Western Nepal, a lack of access to infrastructure, a lack of access to healthcare, to integrated healthcare, and particularly to behavioral health um, among patients uh, who are on Medicaid in, in Michigan uh, or who otherwise lack access to health insurance and, and struggle to afford it. And so what we saw was a, a pretty strong connection between residents of the city of Detroit who shared a lot of that trauma background. It, may, it might look different, but, but mental health trauma was very pronounced, especially in light, of the, um, in, in light of the economic devastation which has befallen Detroit, its bankruptcy, um, and a, a, you know, decades of disinvestment in the city, as well as the fact that the city of Detroit has a very disconnected infrastructure network, poor transportation for folks who can't afford it, some of the highest rates of car insurance and auto payments in the country. Um, and so you, you start looking at what lack of access looks like and it becomes clear that actually looking to developing settings, even remote areas in Western Nepal, can provide a really interesting way to think outside the box and to help us try and, and find new ways of delivering care. And so we tried to test bed this and bring the intervention to Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit to inform how we address and integrate behavioral health in our system. Next slide, please. So how do we get to know NIAIA Health? Um, the Global Health Initiative at Henry Ford Health System has a reciprocal process. We, uh, we lead capacity development initiatives around the world, um, and our uh, main partner in Nepal, in the Kathmandu Valley, is the Group for Technical Assistance. You can see me there with Deepak Bhattacharya. He's their, um, their founder and CEO, and Deepak and his team have done a fantastic job of being boots on the ground and really advocating for and leading initiatives around public health. Um, surveillance in and throughout Nepal in partnership with the Ministry of Health, um, many NGOs, and the university and, um, and, and hospital systems out there. As part of their work, uh, GTA has been connected with uh, research advancing antimicrobial stewardship and antibiotic resistance research, and through that got to know NIAIA Health as an effort to expand some of the work they were doing in antibiotic resistance out in that part of the country. As they learned about the model, Deepak brought it to us and said, you really should check out NIAIA Health. Um, Possible Health, their, their U.S. counterpart, I had been connected with so, sort of serendipitously through some conferences that we'd attended uh, in partnership with Duke Innovations in Healthcare at uh, Duke University, which helped us kind of vet and do some matchmaking with NIAIA and Possible Health to understand better how, with our partnership with a group for technical assistance in Kathmandu, we could understand how to partner together, learn from the intervention that's been successful, and understand whether or not it made sense to have a reciprocal relationship to bring the model from Nepal to test in Detroit, and in return to support capacity development opportunities that were identified by and led with and alongside our partners at NIAIA and the Group for Technical Assistance. And so this burning platform then provides us that reciprocal model that we've been talking about, that Kurobi introduced when we talked about blue marble thinking, and that came up repeatedly in our word cloud, um, which is the opportunity to really create these partnerships that create bi-directional opportunities for learning and programmatic transformation. Next slide. 
So some of our implementation partners, um, I mentioned NIA Health, and obviously uh, they're the ones who are leading the effort to help um, pull in the community health workers and other community members who've been part of the intervention, who've really defined what the needs look like in Western Nepal and how training is to take place. They in turn then have helped create uh, a series of modules, which we're putting into practice now, to train the um, population health coordinators at Henry Ford Health System who work with our behavioral health integration program, which I'll tell you about in just a second. The other community partner I want to name is our Henry Ford Patient Advisory Council. Now, we have several of these councils across the health system, but our population health and our behavioral health councils are bringing together the voices of patients who are often high cost, high need patients, folks who maybe we, we could define in the healthcare world as super utilizers because of repeated visits to the emergency department, but who are compensated by the health system to participate in focus groups and other studies with us to, to, to give feedback to vet materials and to ensure that the work that we're doing is driven by local needs and defined by specifically the needs of our patients. So part of those councils helped our behavioral health team about three or four years ago identify a need to integrate behavioral health services across primary care so that any patient who comes to any primary care setting at Henry Ford Health System has the opportunity to be screened for behavioral health conditions. And if they screen positive and desire it, they can receive a same or next day behavioral health appointment at the setting of their doctor's office. They also have the option to do it virtually from the comfort of their home if they're equipped to do that. But we found it was much easier to get patients to come into the doctor's office where they had an existing relationship than to try to come into a centralized behavioral health office or a practice that specialized in that, which often was difficult to travel to. It may not be close to where they live. As we got that project going, and that's now been scaled over 40 different primary care clinics across the Henry Ford Enterprise in Southeastern Michigan, we discovered that we needed to include the next component of community health work model, the model of navigation, of population health support, screening for the social determinants of health, and really understanding how those challenges inform the patient's experience, not just with primary care access, but with their behavioral and mental health conditions that they've identified as a need that they want support with. And so finally, we've partnered with our community mental health in the state of Michigan. In Michigan, the safety net mental health care system is very fragmented. And in fact, if you're on Medicaid, you're, you're really, we're not allowed to, to, pay, to provide reimbursable behavioral health services for our patients. That has to come out of our community mental health program, which in Detroit is the Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network. But they've been a good partner to us <clears throat> to understand how we can share responsibility for the needs of these patients and have been willing, along with the state of Michigan, to pilot results that we have from this program so that we can continue to spread the good lessons of how uh, integrating community health workers, and particularly the model from Nepal, informs a, a really integrated primary care driven behavioral health approach. Next slide. So we've extended our social determinants of health screening and assessment as part of this work. Uh, we've heard from our patients left and right um, how important it is to have a trusted face, a person that is um, emblematic of the community, that resonates with the needs that they have, that speaks their language, that understands um, their needs. And so we've, we've looked high and low to find CHWs and population health coordinators that can fit that role um, and can meet patients where they are. In fact, we our target demographic for our pilot on this was in Hamtramck, Michigan. Hamtramck has a really high uh, percentage of immigrants from Bangladesh and from Yemen. And so we made sure to find uh, uh, a um, a uh, community health worker that we've trained and deployed who can speak both Bengali and Arabic, uh, who grew up in Hamtramck, and so is really um, able to speak to those needs and is able to really reflect back to these um, the patients that we're serving, a true community voice and advocate in the case, uh, in their care. So we found really great remission maintenance with our low to moderate mental illness. Uh, the program is not designed for individuals with severe mental illness um, because it goes a little bit beyond the scope of training that we have for the therapists and for our coordinators. We've seen 125% increase in our SDOH screening and assessment, and we were already doing really well on this. So to see that level of a jump just went to show how important it is to have that resonant um, person who can really, again, meet you on that level and speak with those, speak with that level of integrity and partnership and trust. 40% uh, decline in relapses and reentry into our behavioral health integration program, which is great because our, our ideal situation is uh, someone meets them on the front end, they, then the patient goes into the behavioral therapy with a trained behavioral therapist, and then when they finish and they hit remission, they're back to that community health worker again to resolve and address any of those SDOH needs that come up after the fact. So that we're, we're working on food, we're working on housing, we're working on transportation and safety and employment and everything else so that those don't become drivers for relapse or for, for triggering those challenges that patients have, have now been able to hopefully manage and continue to manage well. <clears throat> challenges we're still continuing to work on um, how we reimburse for this service and how we get that added um, care team member um, covered either through value-based contracts which we do directly with 
with some of our commercial and uh, Medicare Advantage um, payers, but also on a fee-for-service basis, if and when that's possible, uh, through the collaborative care model, which we are still in the process of um, developing. And so in conclusion, uh, last slide, I will uh, just say that, you know, our, our goal on this always is to um, is to focus on advancing health equity. And we do that in partnership with the Detroit Community Health Improvement Project, um, who have told us time and again that mental health is a top concern. In fact, the top three concern for city residents who've been participating in that CHNA process. Um, we know the social safety net is overburdened, especially with, when it comes to mental health. And we know that we continue to see revolving doors, especially in Michigan and the hospitals with individuals who are moderately to severely mentally ill. So we have to do everything we can um, we know that these issues affect Detroiters who are Black more than anyone else in our city. Um, and you might say, well, Detroit's a majority Black city, and that's true. But when you look at outside of just those factors alone, it's a disproportionate burden that African Americans in our city, and namely in our region, uh, experience related to this. And so if we aren't taking seriously the disproportionate burdens and also hearing what folks are continuing to tell us, we have to be thinking in creative ways to deliver these services. It's even more powerful to be able to leverage NIAIA's work and their model and to ensure that reciprocal commitment as we do this work together. And I'll look forward to talking more about that in our breakouts and answering questions later. Thank you, Alex. Hi, uh, I'm ready for the next slide. There we go. Um, I'm really excited to be able to tell a little bit about what we've learned with the Athens City County Health Department um, and the relationships that we've built through this global learning experience. Um, if you want to move on to the next slide. About four or five years ago, I guess it's five years ago now, 20, the end of 2015, early 2016, we were inv invited by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to participate in an international exchange on social participation and health. And this is with, um, in collaboration with the Training and Research Support Center. Um, five US cities were invited to work with 12 international sites. Um, and there, there are more listed there because many other partners that these partners knew became engaged in the conversation. And the goal really was just to support this um, opportunity to talk about across um, you know, international exchange, these approaches of social participation and health and what we could learn from other countries um, in the US. So next slide. The, at the beginning, the invitation uh, to participate was really around a specific issue with social participation that we were concerned about. And at that point in time, um, Athens County is a very rural community. It has the highest poverty rate in, in Ohio. And we were really looking as a public health organization at how we could use community health workers to kind of bridge the gap for healthcare services and just a connection to community resources. So we really walked into the project wanting to learn more about how community health workers were recruited, what was their role, um, how were they supported, so we had a lot of questions coming in, but at the same time, we had other questions too that we had kind of on the side thinking about um, addressing poverty as a public health issue and, and how to shift existing resource streams to benefit local and smaller communities. Um, we too were working on connecting clinical health systems and community resources. So building a bi-directional referral system um, was kind of in the back of our mind as well. And of course, well, you know, we, uh, at, we're working all the time at trying to provide healthy food, physical activity um, for our local residents. But we also wanted to engage more community members on, on coalitions and um, improve kind of shared decision-making with, with the public health organizations that we have here. And then lastly, we all public health departments in Ohio are required to go through an accreditation process and community engagement is a pretty significant part of that process. So we, these are all the things that were kind of in the back of our mind as we walked into this um, really unique opportunity to, to first and foremost try to understand and build a community health worker program, but how do we address all these other public health issues that have been 
kind of in the back of our mind or that we are working with as well. Next slide. So initially, and, and I, I loved um, the Kevin's presentation too, because it, he really changed a system and that was our desire to change a system. Um, but, and, and we're working on changing that system. And my story is a little bit more personal um, because I learned so much. There was such a shift in my thinking as a public health practitioner about the way we do things and about what's possible. And so I just wanted to start really briefly talking about these, these things that we learned and some of them completely unexpected. And I appreciated the word cloud because um, so many of those words kind of described the change uh, in me as a public health practitioner. Participatory budgeting was, was something that we learned about. Several countries were using community or groups to help shape uh, budgets, local budgets that supported infrastructure and uh, policies um, and even health promotion activities. And so that was something that we were excited to kind of talk about and I'll, and I'll share how we use some of these things in a minute. Reimbursement practices and policies that encourage social power in health. Many countries uh, have, you know, reimbursement mechanisms that fund specifically about social power, or they have um, it's written into their constitution, or they pass laws, social participation laws. So those those kinds of um, policy pieces around community engagement were really interesting to us. There was a community competition in Ecuador in terms of community resources that I'll tell you more about that we loved. Seeing community health workers as advocates was a teaching moment for us as well. Um, we saw how communities or around the world held local health councils where that, again, that decision-making about health came from small groups uh, that informed larger groups um, and that were multi-sector and multi-level. So again, making sure that all sectors of the, of the community were represented on these councils that made informed um, recommendations and priorities to, to uh, more, in, more involved uh, decision-making. And I also recognize my own lack of power in contributing to the state's priorities. Um, as a public health practitioner myself, I, I recognize my lack of power or my lack of engagement in being able to shape the budgets and priorities for my own community based on what, what kind of funding streams kind of come to us as well. But I'll, I'll get to some of the outcomes here too that'll continue on the next slide. Our community health worker program with this idea and this learning about community health workers as advocates, uh, we were involved in a, in a program, community health worker program with three, three other, two other states. So uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio. And some of our community health workers had the highest reduction in hospitalizations, ERs, ER visits, and A1C. Our community health workers consistently were um, saw uh, like a 3.6 to 4% reduction in A1C compared to other community health workers. And I just I know that that's because they our community health worker focus was on um, advocacy. You can go to the next slide. And so we built the uh, training models around community health workers as advocates and not as um, health care workers. Um, and I'd love to tell you more about that if we had more time. So I hope somebody asks me more about that in a breakout. Um, we had a community improvement challenge team competition. And at first it was just a competition, but we used the model in Ecuador where um, teams were building these multi-sector um, groups that, that identify priorities and then were able to use part of the local budget to fund those things. And we were able to get our local county commissioners to share some of the local budget unmarked, unconditional to, to address the, the priorities of local communities. Public health accreditation, um, age-friendly communities, all of these things we have been able to expand through um, the, the things that we have learned through our, our experience uh, with other folks around the world. Um, and then the last thing I'll just talk about is this making change visible. So this is kind of a part two of our first project. We're now working with other countries, um, Slovenia, France, Ecuador, 
in the UK um, to implement a to create this implementer's guide for measuring health impact from social participation in health. Last slide. And then lastly, and I think there's one more slide. Oh, there's two more slides. I won't talk about the challenges. I think um, we've already heard about some of those challenges, but I just want to go to the very last slide, which is next to share, you know, some of the things that too fast. One of the things that has changed all of us, all of the five US cities and the 12 countries that were participating in the exchange is that participation is both a means for health improvement and an end in itself based on health as a human right. And that community experience, wherever it is, is an entry point for that participation. And sometimes it's formal and sometimes it's for informal, but both of those processes are key. Um, institutional and individual facilitators play a critical role and that whole concept of shared decision making that's linked to every step of um, health equity and health planning um, is important to engage community members and deepening participation it takes a consistency of time presence and capacity and, and I'm grateful to share the story and I think I have learned so much and again have been shaped as a public health practitioner um, based on my community or my global learning experience. That was my lightning round. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so time. much, Ruth. That's <laughs> wonderful. I appreciate that. And now um, I believe, uh, Carmen, you are delivering the presentation. We're, we're looking forward to it. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead. Um, I'm not sure if Sonia is on, if you wanted to start Sonia and then I'll take over. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, it's just so nice to be with all of you. And I'm, I'm, I guess like in a way our story is sort of like um, a global health story within a story. So I'll kind of um, provide a little bit about, you know, sort of how um, our organization came about, but then we really wanted to actually um, uh, share um, our experience of um, a very structured exchange with Cuba. And so Carmen will kind of go through that narrative and it echoes a lot of what um, Karubi had talked about. Um, so on the next slide, um, you know, basically um, what you can see is that um, COPE is actually part of a larger um, um, network, global health network um, called Partners in Health. And um, myself, as somebody who's at Brigham and Women's Hospital, you know, um, we were essentially invited to um, collaborate um, with Navajo Nation about a decade ago. And um, I just kind of, again, wanted to set the stage because, you know, this in and of itself was sort of taking um, paradigms, for instance, community health workers that, um, you know, Ruth was talking about um, this, you know, kind of idea of like, public goods, um, as opposed to, you know, sort of like privatized, um, you know, commodification of pri uh, pu public goods that sometimes we, you know, see in the United States that can actually um, impact equity. Um, so the, we, when we were invited to work in Navajo Nation, you know, we were bringing some of, um, you know, decades of experience um, in programs across the world. And um, I think one thing that's really important to, to note is that, um, for Navajo Nation, you know, when, um, what made them actually kind of want to work with us, you know, sort of what, why did they even invite us to collaborate? Well, for a couple of years, um, you know, our team, uh, partners in health um, providers actually just did site visits and just visited and saw patients and did home visits with community health workers and just listened. And I, I really think that that sort of, you know, kind of like, um, uh, and I know one of the um, participants commented on this, like sort of like coming in without an agenda, you know, and just like sort of hearing and then thinking and reflecting to see, well, you know, are, is there anything that we could actually kind of offer um, to strengthen what's important to them? I think that that sentiment was really, you know, probably uh, very important um, for um, our local partners to sort of, you know, perceive um, value in um, having this collaboration. So um, ultimately, you know, we, we began to work about a decade ago and we've um, established a nonprofit, uh, but I'm going to kind of pause here and allow Carmen to sort of fast forward to a very specific, um, um, you know, kind of second chapter of, of global learning. Thanks. 
Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, just a little bit about, um, Sonia mentioned about um, Medic and um, I think we heard a little bit about that from Karabi. So um, I think everyone's familiar, but it stands for Medical Education Cooperation with Cuba. And um, since 2005, Medic has been um, doing community-based work in establishing these community partnerships for health equity. So um, Medic reached out to Navajo Nation and invited um, us as co also to participate in the Community Partnership for Health Equity program. And so there were other um, communities, like I said, that were already um, established that already took some of these trips. And so what we did was we reached out to some of our partners um, around the Navajo Nation and we asked if they would be interested in um, participating in this um, partnership. And a lot of them were and they um, applied um, to be a part of this program. And so the, um, the, the clinic that ended up being part of it is Four Corners Regional Healthcare Center. And so there it was doctors, it was um, community health workers, it was um, leaders, spiritual leaders um, that participated in this partnership. Um, go ahead and go on to the next slide. So just a little bit about the Navajo Nation to give you context about kind of things um, with Navajo Nation and Cuba and some of the things that we um, thought about in um, forming this partnership. You know, Navajo Nation is one of the largest um, indigenous nations in the U.S. Um, it's um, square mileage, they usually say is as big as um, West Virginia. We have 250,000 residents that live on the Navajo Nation. And so there were U.S. policies that forced removal from the reservation. And so um, it kind of reflected and it kind of mirrored much like what Cuba was going through. So before we took the community members to Cuba, we kind of went through some of the history, some of the, um, the likeness. And so it was really interesting kind of to see um, um, what was learned. And I feel like, you know, going back to the word cloud, a lot of the community members, well, all of us, we went in humility and just wanted to be collaborative and we wanted to learn. Um, and I think this was a big part of, uh, of attending this um, community partnership for health equity. Go ahead and go on to the next slide. So there was a lot of um, things that were um, learned and just in speaking with a lot of our community partners, you know, it, it brought a lot of the community members together. It brought leaders of local chapters. It brought spiritual leaders together. Um, and we, you know, we went to different um, events at Cuba, we attend, we went to schools, we went to hospitals, diabetes education centers, and, you know, there was a lot that was learned there. Um, and I think a lot of the times, um, the community members that went, the community members and leaders, really um, came out with um, just a thankfulness of what we have here in the U.S. and kind of just um, wanting to, um, they were inspired a lot by Cuba because there, there was a sense of resilience. There was a sense of doing things together. And I think it took that to um, really reflect back on how things used to be back, um, back in traditional times, you know, before um, um, these modern, structures were put up. And so I think a lot of it um, 
when we reflected back with a lot of the community members, it led to our continued work with the community and kind of that's how we identified what, um, what things that we wanted to work on. And so go ahead and go on to the next slide. So there were different exchanges that occurred. Um, the Navajo um, community members that went, you know, in the leadership that went, they really um, um, felt close um, as far as just um, with Cuba, you know, just kind of um, wanting to, what they saw there, you know, there was like when we visited the school, there were, um, kids that were in kindergarten and first grade learning CPR and, you know, just learning about that. Like, what are things that we can prevent um, as well? What are things that um, kids can learn in our schools? Um, there was a lot of living off the land. Um, there was a place where there were um, um, trash dumps that were turned into organic farms. Um, and so just learning all that, I think it was really um, looking back at our own um, strengths and our own um, beliefs. It was kind of a shift there. You could see that um, as the community members um, engaged with Cuba, you know, there were a lot of things that we learned um, there. They had, you know, this elder home you can see in the picture that's a um, senior citizen center. It's right next to the school. And a lot of Navajo Nation is like that and kind of the exchanges that happened there. I think um, that was really neat kind of to see and just learning about the culture and um, learning about food sovereignty. I think that was one of the main things that came out of it. Um, at the time we went with um, Vice President Jonathan Nez. Currently he is president of Napa Nation. And so um, just coming out of it was a lot of um, being able to grow our own food. And that was what came out of it is the community members um, came up with their own motto of growing our own, you know, growing our own leaders, growing our own doctors, growing our own food. And so I think a lot of that they could identify and it came from this um, global learning process. And so if you can go on to the next slide. So right now they continue to work on different projects. So this is just a poster of some of the projects that have been implemented since the trip. There's been um, community cleanups, um, They've implemented um, trash to art. You know, they learned that a lot of um, art is highlighted in Cuba. And so they, that's what was missing in some of the schools. And so they've implemented that where they do a trash cleanup, but at the same time, they work on projects with parents and students and they create um, art pieces. And so that's been something that's been ongoing. Um, there's been a lot of, um, gardens, whether it's in the a whole community farm or whether it's a small school garden, a classroom garden or at home. And then also bringing into it um, the cultural part, you know, the teachings around growing, like how you speak to, to seeds, how you have it grow, um, having elders teach kids. So all that I think has been um, um, brought about with this trip, you know, bringing that experience. And I think it took that trip to really see um, the community's own strengths too, um, to um, move these projects. So we continue to do that and we can move on to the next slide. We continue to grow and learn and the um, CPHE team is a big part of our co-organization. And I think one of the things that I wanted to highlight with this um, picture is that there, um, they have local um, heroes that they look up to. And when we were there, um, the, the group was like, why can't we have our own local heroes? And so when we did this project about um, water and um, promoting um, water, um, they thought, well, why can't we find our own local heroes that kids can look up to that can drink water? And so this is kind of where that project led to. So a lot of um, the people that went 
are on some of our advisory boards and help us with our work. And so you'll always hear things that they've learned from Cuba and things not only from that, but what was brought out was the strength of our own community and our own people. And that I feel like came out of global learning. It kind of was a chance to reflect back. Thank you so much, Carmen and Sonia for sharing that, especially that last comment, it seems so important in this is, is the learning that goes back and forth. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. And now we'll have Kevin Fiore. Great, thanks, Virginia. Thanks, Carmen, that was a great presentation. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Janet. So I wanna take some time uh, to talk about two learning health organizations, one based in, and you can, I apologize in advance, Janet, these are, there's a bunch of animation, so hit it, hit forward. Um, one organization that is based in Northern Togo in West Africa, uh, it part, it's called Integrate Health, it partners with the Togolese government to help provide um, primary care, uh, focusing on maternal and child health care. Right now, that organization is supporting over 200,000 patients at 21 village health centers. And at the foundation of that approach is the use of community health workers. Uh, advance. And I'm gonna also talk about a health system where I'm talking from today, uh, Monitor Health System and Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which is based in Bronx, New York, which is a borough and a county of New York State. And that health system's uh, goal of um, assessing unmet social needs in over 300,000 primary care patients uh, at 19 different locations. And again, the goal with that initiative is using community health workers at the foundation of that. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna give a little bit more background about the, um, the destination site. So um, the initiative in the Bronx that looked to outside the Bronx to try to uh, figure out how to address this challenge of integrating social needs screening and outreach into clinical practice. So one of the things we did is we invested in uh, a standardized social needs screen that we put into our electronic health record, Advance, Hit advanced like three times, I think, Janet. Um, it's a, um, a 10 item uh, validated questionnaire that we developed from Health Leads. It's integrated within our EHR. We've built out um, uh, uh, referral orders for providers to refer to community health workers. And we've also advanced two more times. We've also uh, invested in an online social service directory, and we're partnering with a community-based um, uh, uh, community organization called the Bronx Community Health Network, which recruits, supervises, and hires CHWs to work at our primary care sites throughout the Bronx. Next slide. So when this initiative was going on, one of the sites, a pediatric clinic in the Southern Bronx, decided to start a nested pilot. And the goal of that nested pilot was to optimize social needs screening using community health worker support. And one of the things we wanted to do was to identify core program implementation components. How do we do this in practice? And right away, what I thought was, there are things that Rebecca, my colleague here from Rural Pindi does in Togo, advance, that my colleague Janet, pictured here who works in the Bronx can learn from. And the question is, how do you do this? What is the mechanism by which you could do this? Next slide, please. And what we did is we actually looked to a guide that was developed with um, a global um, perspective um, that is utilized, has been utilized and was meant to accompany the, the uh, recent WHO community health worker guidelines that came out in 2018. And so this guide hit uh, advanced three times, please again. This guide actually gives um, different domains of how to, how to um, optimize community health worker programs. It has a, a self um, judging rubric on the bottom from non-functional to highly functional. And what we did as a team is we just compared what we were doing in Northern Togo to what we were doing in the South Bronx. I hit advance a couple of times. 
sorry, Janet, you're getting your work uh, out of this. Um, and what we unsurprisingly found was that the Northern Togo program was outperforming the Southern Bronx program. And the question was, what could we learn from that? And we focused on four aspects, data supervision, community involvement, and integration in the health system, and the aspects of what they were doing in Togo that were transferable to the South Bronx. Um, hit next slide, please. And just to fast forward to our results. So this is our health system, what I, which I had mentioned. So these are 18 primary care clinics. This is looking at how many active patients did they screen over the first 20 minutes of our program. And as you recall, we started at one of those clinics called CHCC. Um, hit next slide, please. This nested pilot, or hit advance, please. This nested pilot, and it's outperformed by a lot. 81, it screened, oh, one back. It screened over 81% of active patients, far outperforming all of the other practices. Now, you could say, pediatricians are awesome and pediatric, pediatric nurses are awesome. And that's why this happened, which I agree with that assessment. But I think what happened is we learned a lot on how to integrate CHWs well into our clinic using best practices from places like Togo. Um, next slide, please. And our institution feels so strongly about this that we are actually investing in the infrastructure to have it for how to do this. Um, something called the Community Health Systems Lab, which is a new, uh, is a new um, unit that is based at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. It's a partnership between Integrate Health, Department of Family and Social Medicine and Pediatrics. Hit next slide. Hit advance, please. And the goal is to, um, using these four core activities, um, uh, figure out how we do this in practice. How do we take these um, innovative ideas, learn from them and, and put them into practice? So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to talking with all of you or the, the folks that are in my breakout room and answering any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Kevin, for your presentation. And now we'll move to Yolanda. So hello everyone again, I'm excited to be here uh, with you and talking about a research study um, that I'm doing at University of Maryland, Baltimore called Family Social Inclusion, Global Learning um, from Brazil to Baltimore. Um, I don't think I could have better partners um, in my Brazilian partners from Saúde Criança, which their new name is Dara Institute. Um, they're here on the line with me and I'm really grateful that they're here in the room. I wanna share a little bit about um, how I began to think about global learning um, and to do this work. Um, next slide, please. So I've been fortunate to uh, work in global health for about two decades. And one of the things that I noticed as I was able to go around the world is that very often I learned more from my partners um, then often I felt like I was able to contribute. And I feel strongly that there was a need to move away from what we had previously known as knowledge exchange and move really forward to bi-directional learning. Um, I'm a native of Baltimore City, I'm pictured here on the top. And one of the things I saw, no matter where I went, was Baltimore is not alone. Um, in the challenges that it faces. Um, all over the world, I think marginalized populations um, live in suboptimal environments, often on the fringes of really large cities. Um, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil is another example where marginalized um, populations um, have nearly identical social and health outcomes to Baltimore. Um, I could share those statistics with you, but um, you're familiar with them. And what I will say is that these common health inequities um, transcend national borders, offering an opportunity for global learning to find solutions. In Rio de Janeiro, I really felt they had the advantage. They had a program that was successfully tackling a, pro a problem that was really interesting to me. Um, I've been very interested in social isolation, particularly community social isolation, and how the social and built environment of cities um, contribute to individuals and families feeling socially isolated within the communities that they live. And in, in, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, next slide, 
um, they have a program um, and the program is called Sade Crianza or Daria Institute. Um, and this program um, focused specifically on social inclusion. Um, specifically, the individuals at Sade Crianza believe that the most important characteristic of health is social inclusion. And that social inclusion is the antidote to social isolation. Um, and so they work with families from marginalized communities. Um, they recruit them from the health system, perform a baseline assessment, and they walk alongside families in a co-responsibility agreement um, through a family action plan methodology that they developed. Families receive monthly coaching, a support group and provision, they offer direct provision of resources um, and, research and, and or referral to resources over a two year period. The program is very strategic in that it works in five areas, health, housing, citizenship and income generation. Um, and I was really uh, fascinated with their program as I began to look on the um, on the web, and it's not that we don't address um, the social determinants of health in these five areas in the United States. It's really the issue that we don't think about it as social inclusion, making sure that everybody has an equal and fair opportunity to be included in society. So I began to think about this work and how we could replicate this program in Baltimore. Next slide, please. One of the things that I quickly understood that it is impossible to think about global learning without collaboration, both locally and globally. And so I had to develop really a strong sense of community partners. And I had to remember that people in Baltimore would be at the center of all partnerships and to engage them within the whole research process. Um, and so what you see here is we have a really great interprofessional group of professionals that are working with me um, on the project. Um, we're looking at social isolation and the impact on um, mental health. So we have Black Mental Health Alliances, as well as Be More Healthy Babies, which is a program that works with young mothers. Um, really important, um, my team members are predominantly from Baltimore um, and their community health worker, as well as the program manager. Um, Janet North Kabore, who's helping us with this slide, a very important member of the team. Thank you, Janet. Next slide, please. So in terms of community engagement for global learning and really thinking about how to adapt programs globally, locally, I think it's really important to think about community engagement from conception to dissemination. Um, and so for our project, we went to community members before we submitted the proposal to see what they thought about the idea. Um, and they were really excited about the idea. Um, we also had a community engagement phase of the proposal where we sat down through focus groups and interviews and met with families um, in the community to see if they would even accept the idea of global learning. You know, whether we like it or not, some people might think still that American, America is exceptional. Why would we bring a program from abroad? But when we talked to community members to ask them if they would be ex willing to accept the global learning program, they said absolutely yes, um, they would, because some of their health equity issues had not been addressed for many years. So why not try something new? Um, and so we were able to build these partnerships. Another phase of the community engagement and the adaptation process was really to define the core elements. Um, I find that in the US, there are many, many programs addressing the social determinants of health, but normally not all five of those areas at once, even though that we know that they intersect each other. Um, very often we're focusing on one housing or transportation. Um, and so I needed to see if the partners thought we needed all of them. Um, and there were a little mixed reviews and some people thought maybe we could do just three of them. Um, and so we moved forward with this idea of doing three. Can you go to the next slide? Um, and this is where the um, issue of bi-directional learning comes in. Um, it was really important that we work very closely with our global um, innovators at the Daria Institute. And what they said to me was, Without all five areas, you don't have the DNA of our program. 
And so you don't have the core elements or the core components. And so we move forward with what we then call the Belong to Baltimore study. Um, the Belong to Baltimore study has the core ingredients of the Saudi Criança program in Brazil. We work in the same five areas and we also recruit those most in need. Um, because it is a research study, it's a longitudinal cohort study, um, we not only assess them at baseline, but we do so at six months, 12 months, um, at, at six months and 12 months. Um, we have uh, community health workers or family navigators that meet with these families once a month. Um, and I'm really excited to tell you that while we're at the beginning of the study, um, we've been fortunate to recruit 24 families um, that have invested one year in the study. Um, and the participants um, are, are um, really and seem to be enjoying the, the program. Um, we meet with the uh, families monthly. And we're learning not only from our partners abroad, but we're learning from the families in our community. One of the things that we've learned is these community members do have power. They have the power to solve their own social determinants of health challenges. But what they really need is information. They need attention to their specific needs and they need connection to social resources that seem invisible to them. We're having many interesting findings um, we're learning that families need to better understand civic engagement. Um, they need to um, more information about their financing, but we're also hearing about their dreams about entrepreneurship and becoming uh, community social workers themselves. At baseline, we've begun to understand that yes, these families do, under, do experience social isolation and 65% of them report moderate to high social isolation. Um, they also um, have moderate to high anxiety. And we understand that their social isolation is significantly associated with stress and anxiety. Um, growing up in the same community as my participants, I often wondered what the impact of hope was on social isolation. And so an additional measure that we looked at was the impact of hope. And what we're finding is that as hope increases, social isolation decreases at baseline. So these are our baseline findings and we have a lot more to share as we move forward. Um, when we think about global learning, we need to think about bi-directional um, um, learning with our partners. Some of what we've learned has been reciprocated by our partners. Our partners have also learned. They've learned how to measure social isolation. Um, you know, they've learned, they, we meet with them monthly. They're very interested in what we're learning in terms of our successes and cha uh, challenges. We do collaborative presentations and manuscript, and they have done audit and feedback of our program. And then one last slide. Next one. So at the end, in terms of health equity, we hope that there'll be increased awareness um, of global learning. Um, but another thing that we've learned is that this idea of global learning is a catalyst for global health education and research. So as you listen to our comments today, one of the things I just want to leave you with is as part of this project, our students have been able to engage in global learning experiences. Um, we've been able to expand research, which was uh, presented at the Dissemination and Implementation Science Conference, um, showing how we use implementation science to really measure the adaptation. Um, and so there's still so much to learn, but we're still having a ripple effect of global learning just from our project with Brazil. So again, I thank my Brazilian partners who are on the line and welcome questions from you um, in the breakout room um, and in the panel questions section. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that and uh, Yolanda and all the other presenters. And it looks like, amazingly, we're doing okay on time. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. And um, I got two that were private chatted to me, but I want to ask if anyone wants to unmute, the, uh, sorry, unmute their mic and ask any of the panelists a question. Does that include me? 
I can't see the um, whoever is asking. I can only see this thin screen at the top. But whoever, yeah, Dr. Thomas here. Oh, Dr. Thomas, please uh, go ahead. Yes. So, so my questions for my Brazilian friends, and I just think this is so amazing that we can be in Zoom and have people from around the world. This is for my Brazilian friends. Um, all I have to do is pick up the newspaper today, and you're all over the newspaper as it relates to COVID. And so my question is, the presentation we just heard, the excellent work we just heard from Dr. Yolanda, and now you're in the midst of a spike in COVID there in your country, has that spike, the pandemic, changed what we just saw? How has it maybe changed the trajectory or changed the way you even think about it, given now that we're in the midst of this pandemic? Sure. So I'll begin and then I'll ask Adriani to unmute as well to join in, um, as I'm fortunate to have her here from Daria Institute. Um, what I will say is that we know that we've had similar experiences even during COVID. It's been pretty amazing. We've both um, transitioned our, per our programs to virtual format. And we also had students that uh, worked on a virtual global health project. They have a poster at CUGH, in fact, um, this time. Um, that looked at a cross country comparison of how we had to modify our, our uh, work as well as the, um, the social determinant drivers of COVID outcomes, both in the US and in Brazil. Um, so Adriani, how much has your work been changed um, by uh, COVID-19 in Brazil? Well, good afternoon. It, it is really a pleasure to be here and to hear all these uh, challenges that uh, people have to, to share with us. And uh, also I have to say that it is really, really a pleasure to work with Yolanda. And we are working for more than three years, maybe four right now. And, it, and it's always uh, a monthly pleasure to talk to her and learn and we learn, we really learn together. Uh, yes, COVID is a, a big challenge here in Brazil. And we are having a, a year of challenges, right? So since last March, all our work was uh, in our headquarters and we had to understand how we could still help these families and, and continue helping these families uh, uh, not, not being in these headquarters. So we shifted all our attendance, all our, our connections to the families to a virtual um, style, right? So. Uh, um, we had uh, calls with to these families. We had many uh, videos that we sent them, that we asked them also. And we had all the moments, the special moments that we had with them, we had to make it all virtual. Uh, this, this pandemic showed us that we don't have to be in the same place that the families so that the work has, uh, is done. It showed that it is possible to make it virtual, but it also showed us that the, the, when we are uh, face to face, eyes to eyes, then the connection is bigger. And then, uh, yes, the results are bigger also. But as we were able to, to transfer all of the, the work that we do to a virtual aspect, also did Yolanda there in Baltimore, she also could do this with the, 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 the participants. And she also could make this sessions with them virtually. And the results has been very good. It has been very interesting to see the, the, the transformation that these, fam these families or these people do with their own lives. So they look at the power that they have inside them and they need, they see the information that is given to them and the space and, and the, the moment that they can share their challenges. And yes, they, can, they, they have been improving a lot. So yes, it has been a challenge, but yes, we have been uh, possible. It has been possible to, to change it to a virtual work. Well, you know, you're inspiring me. And Dr. Yolanda, you're inspiring me because the work that you did laying the groundwork before the pandemic, the humility, the trust, then the pandemic hits, and now you have the trust you need to translate 
that trustworthiness into the virtual environment. Doesn't take the place of, but it sure helps that you have it already. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that question and that wonderful answer. And, and welcome to our Brazilian colleagues um, for joining us today. Would anyone else like to ask a question of any of the panelists? Don't make us put you back in a word cloud. <laughs> that that brought them out, didn't it? <laughs> well, one, one person asked a question, but now she's gone. But I think it was a very good question. She wanted to ask um, Ruth Dudding. Um, she, you mentioned that um, that the community health workers are advocates more than healthcare workers. And what does uh, that mean? When we approached our community health worker program, we really wanted to recruit community members who are already acting in that capacity. And we engage community health workers um, with our, our local decision making in terms of their representation of, of the people that they work with. One thing that we learned from other countries too is that they actually elected their community health workers sometimes. So, so that person that represented them in this health capacity was actually chosen by the community. So we really wanted to, to try to recreate that somehow and, and look for people who can, who are already kind of connecting people to resources in their community um, and doing the work of a community health worker. You, you know, Ruth, you're, you're reminding me here that one of the things we've done is train our barbers and stylists because they already have trust. And I'm looking at these Hollywood squares and my friends in Brazil, and I'm saying, hey, you've got barbershops and salons down there in Brazil, right? Hey, how might we get international barbershops and salons involved in this kind of activity as a cross-fertilization? And in Maryland, uh, Ruth, uh, three of our barber stylists have now been certified by the state of Maryland as official community health workers. Nice. Sure. It looks like Ruth has another question in the chat, Virginia, from um, Alex Greenfield. Alex, I'm not sure if you wanted to unmute. Uh, sure. I was just hoping Ruth might speak to, she mentioned some multi-sectoral uh, intervention that Athens was implementing um, from Global Learning, and if she could just give a little more detail. Yeah. Um, so one of the ways we've been doing that is with the care coordination network. And we actually use, um, we have a platform where community health workers, healthcare um, providers, social service agencies, lifestyle change programs, the library, anybody who's, who's connected to people can come together to strengthen the way resources are accessed in Athens County. Um, we also have a, I talked about the community improvement challenge teams. Um, that's that's our, our local county commissioners hoping to engage communities, um, people who are local business owners, people who are retired, people who are uh, still in, in public school, like having, you know, a different variety of people working together to make decisions. And, and so we're really excited about that as well. Thank you so, so much, Ruth. Um, it looks like Nancy wanted to ask about the social determinants of health um, screening model. Nancy, do you want to unmute yourself? I think that's for Kevin. Um, I, I think Alex too, they have a, a tool in Detroit as well. Um, our tool here in, um, in New York City, and I apologize if the four train is going past me now, um, it's starting to get rush hour. So we're on a uh, heightened schedule. Um, we developed a tool that is based on the Health Leads Toolkit, which is uh, an NGO based in the US that has a lot of experience in working with different health systems to develop screening questions uh, to identify unmet social needs. Um, and we had a multidisciplinary team here that included social work, um, uh, community-based organizations, uh, different clinical departments to come up with a 10-item screener adapted from that tool that uh, 
we could integrate into clinical practice. And so it's something that our providers here do during like a, uh, an annual physical visit. And then we have built in um, opportunities for those providers to refer families that want additional help with social service navigation um, with our, our um, community health workers that are based throughout our health system. I don't know if Alex had, you wanted to mention anything about Detroit. Sorry, struggling to come off mute there. No, I think I, I don't want to over speak it, Kevin. I think you did a great job getting it. I mean, I think um, yeah, we can go to the next question. I, I didn't have, I don't think I have anything super specific about Detroit that doesn't kind of speak to your context. Great. As, as since we're coming up to a break, I just had one more question. If, if I wanted to, if I could direct this to Carmen, um, have you had more visits than that after that initial visit with um, Cuba or going back to Cuba? folks from Cuba visiting your community? Yeah, we've had, um, so in 2015, we had our first trip. And then I think it was in 2016, we had a second trip. So we were able to send, I think a total of around um, 30 to 40 community members. And then along with that, um, in 2018, we sent some youth um, to do an exchange as well. And some of the medical students that we met in Cuba have also come when they come to the U.S. visited um, our site. And so we um, had some exchanges that way. We have networking meetings with um, the whole um, CPHG network, um, probably about once a quarter. And so we're able to continue our relationship there. Thank you so much for sharing. I think this was a very good discussion. Um, we, I know everyone would appreciate a break um, right now. So why don't we take a break and, and come back at, um, at four and, it, and we'll start the exercise so that we can move into the breakout rooms. Does that work for everybody? See you back at four. Um, uh, thank you so much um, again, everyone for being here. And I just wanted to, Start off in the in the email that you received. You should have received a mini uh, kind of training um, for the next exciting session that we're going to do. And I'm going to we can go over that really quick. I'm going to drop it in the chat. One second. Okay, it's in the chat and everyone can go there and just kind of follow the instructions that are on that screen. Hold on, I'm gonna join you as well. So for this part of our session, we're gonna have some breakout rooms and we are going to be doing some brainstorming together. We love to hear your ideas about global learning. Um, so we're going to start off just very briefly with a practice session. So you can click the link that Janet sent. Hold on one second. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so here's where we are in the chat session. I dropped a link there and it should take you right here and you can type in your name when it um, as a visitor, come in, you can type your name and, and it's going to also give you, if you don't type your name, it's going to give you things like visiting bear or searching fish or something of that nature. Are you able to see my screen at this moment? Oh, that's a little tricky. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good. So basically, um, just to do a quick um, run through so we can kind of get an idea of what you will be doing. So um, it's step by step. It's um, something that um, you can just, it's like a, it's literally a virtual whiteboard. And on that whiteboard, you're just going to put little sticky notes. So you'll go in and you will just double click. The first one is just saying zooming in and out. And that's just, if you have a mouse, you can just go scroll up and scroll back. And it's also a little window 
right down here where you can also do your zoom in and out there as well. Okay, and I think some people on I, on Max they can do a plus minus or um, command plus and minus. And then so here it says to just create a sticky note, you just double click on the space. So you double click on the space, you'll see that little white dot and you can just grab the edge of that dot and pull it out just like that. And then just type in there and that's it. And you'll also see this little bar that comes up across here. Really quick, you can just change the color. If you wanna change the color, you can uh, change the shape. If you decide you wanna change the shape, font, things of that, that nature, formatting and things like that. And so, on, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so another thing is, you, if you say, oh, I don't want it right here, I'm going to put it here. So you just, just click on it and just drag and drop, drag and drop right over to the next section. And then I see um, different people moving things about. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> so like I said, you could do all of the things. It's really quick. Um, some of the other tips, if you are having problems with that, they're also over here in these little tabs where you can text and it'll burn bring out the exact color that you want or box or shape right here on this sidebar here. Um, it also has like a title bar where you can uh, click on and it'll bring up uh, a little title bar for you. It'll pop up. Again, a little square for you. Someone just took my square <laughs> and then um, open it up and then type something into it as well. But to me, it's just a lot easier to double click into the space here and then you'll have your square there, your little post-it note. Um, there are other things as well, just, um, just briefly, they're just little icons you can drag over as well into um, the area. And then same thing, you just grab the little, one of these little squares and change the size, color, whatever you decide. Okay. And if you have any questions, there's also a, chat box right here and then also we have chat box for zoom um you can also just kind of speak up and i think the most important thing is you can't break it so don't worry about anything when you're in here um just do the best you can if you leave a sticky somewhere we can always move it later um after the event um and so we really just want to go in and have fun with it um, so we'll be having two breakout rooms. Um, one will be a research implementation breakout room, um, and the other one will focus on global learning education. Um, and so I believe you've been randomly selected. Is that right, Jen? That is correct. <laughs> so you'll hey, be, Jan, um, Janet, I'll put can, yes. can you um, put the link for the education in, in the chat. Um, I, I, I think I have the right link, but just in, in case people can't get through on that link. So what I'm going to do to avoid that, um, I'll, dro I'll drop you your link. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So just this is great, time. Janet. I'm going to stop sharing. Stephen, thanks for putting the wordly as your picture. It just gave us so much to think about. Okay, Virginia, you can um, share this link in your break room when you get there. Okay, great. You're sending it to me. Oh, great. Perfect. Okay. And I'm going to open up the break rooms right now. We can jump right on over there. And I believe it's uh, 40 minutes that we have. Uh, until um, 4.40 Eastern time. Okay. So it's more like half an hour. Okay. All right, it's set. They're gonna close in 30 minutes. All right, let's go. 
I felt like I was on Starship Enterprise. <laughs> and I was beamed into a Welcome home. back. I'm glad you guys have your cameras on. It really helps. That was fun. <laughs> it worked, Yolanda. Our boards are really full of really good ideas. No, that's great. <laughs> um, just to remind, um, just to share that the boards will uh, still be up for, is it two days? Yeah, they'll be up for the next two days and then we will lock them. So if you felt like you wanted to add more to the boards and you were not able to just put in all of your comments um, to all of the questions, please feel free um, to open up Miro. You'll still have the link and you'll be able to continue to add to the session. We know the breakout session was short. Um, and then another powerful thing is eventually we will lock the board and we will categorize all of the ideas um, and we will share with you um, the board once it's all categorized. Um, so we're really uh, looking forward to um, sharing that with you once it's done. But even though the breakout session ends, it's not over. You can still share more. So I think the next, um, the ne for the next um, I part of the session, we're going to have um, some feedback. So maybe we can start with the education room. Sure. Well, thank you. That time went so quickly. It's, it's um, extremely quickly. So our report out won't be long. Um, and I think we did spend quite a bit of time <laughs> at the beginning <laughs> figuring out how to um, use our sticky notes and things like that. But um, I would say, and I'll ask others to um, pipe up, but we did talk about the importance of global learning um, in the health equity space. And, and, I, and I think what was emerged from that was this idea that really to understand health equity fully, you need to sort of take that 10,000 mile view and understand that um, there are different communities, different communities often share the same problems or some form of the same problem. And that there's, um, there's an opportunity for um, learning in that view and also different solutions and approaches, which is the basis of, of, of global learning. So it seems like the concept of global learning is, is an important way of teaching about health equity and viewing health equity. And the second thing I would add is that we talked about is that there is not a holistic curriculum to teach global learning and to bring that to students. There are pieces of it, I think as James Husband said, pieces of the elephant, there's ethical components that we teach in global health. Um, there's a, a growing movement to decolonialize global health education. There's different things that, in the way global health is taught that, um, uh, or, you know, that could, that, that there are different elements that could create a global learning curriculum, but that's not, it's not there yet. And so that may be something in the future that would help educators uh, teach global learning, especially for health equity. So um, are there any other, um, it was such a short time. I, I, I hope I captured our conversation. Uh, anything else that anyone wants to add from our group? Yes, um, this is Steven. Our friends from Brazil, I just love our colleagues. They brought up the pedagogy of the oppressed, Paulo Freire. And at one point when I was in school, that was standard reading. Uh, I don't know if that's always the case. And so the notion that we're talking about global lessons that come from countries with different political systems and the extent to which that is accepted or rejected here in the US, because we just came through four years of hyperpolarization, and clearly pedagogy of the oppressed is all about lifting up the most vulnerable. And sometimes that gets tagged with, you know, income distribution and all the stuff we play around here in the States that are just a mess. I don't know what my friends from other countries when they look at us think, because <laughs> clearly COVID has humbled us, right? And the other thing is why aren't we learning from other countries 
that have clearly done a much better job of protecting their most vulnerable. And here we are throwing it all to the wind. I just wonder how they look at us from Brazil or how they look at us from any of the other countries that are in these squares and how we in the US are gonna turn things around because a mirror, a bright mirror and a bright light is on our inequalities right now. Mm -hmm. And that came out, it wasn't in all the stickies, but we got two days, guys, to put those things on, on the post-it notes. So thank you for that, uh, Dr. Thomas. Um, and then Kevin, can you give uh, some feedback from- Sure, Alex? it's um, not fun following up Dr. Thomas, um, but um, just to go on, just to piggyback on some of the themes that he brought up that definitely came out in our research. And it, again, it came back to the word cloud, some of the key terms that came up, this, this concept of humility, uh, being open to ideas. Um, our group, uh, we, we, I don't, I'm not gonna say we mastered mural, but we got better over time. Um, so that was good. I think the next time we did this, we'll be, we'll, we'll be pros. But I think different, different uh, people on the call are at different stages um, of where they are with their global learning project. Um, be a lot of discussion about implementation science and using it to understand sort of core parts of um, how you put into place, you know, evidence-based practice and how you adapt that practice, maybe being the more important part and learning from that um, community-based participatory research and working with communities instead of conducting research on them uh, was something that I, I heard in a lot of the comments. Um, and um, again, I, I think the, the star of our session was uh, hearing from this, this Brazil-Baltimore connection and the experience that they've had um, back and forth um, in, in, in trying to, to learn uh, in, a, in really a bi-directional way. So um, those are just some few comments. I don't know if anybody else from the group wants to, to say anything else, Sonia or, or Yolanda or no, I think um, you really captured it well. Um, it was interesting that um, there were a few people in the implementation phase of global learning, um, but some in scale up, um, and then others who were just beginning to think about it. Um, and so we know we have a lot of diversity in the group that's online today in terms of where we are for global learning. Um, it was also the discussion that some community members may not be open to this idea of global learning, um, and there may be some resistance um, to global learning, um, depending on um, how people perceive a country. The example in Brazil was um, local participants in Baltimore uh, were open to it, um, but when in Brazil, they were open to a program from the US, um, but they were surprised to understand that a program from Brazil was so heavily impacting um, people in Baltimore. Um, and so I think we still have a lot to learn um, about it, but um, we do have a few sticky notes and we welcome some more. We'll welcome questions from people that were in the education room to the research team and vice versa. One of the things that came up in our session, or at least one of the stickies, had to do with if you're taking an equity lens and you're measuring outcomes, if you're not measuring outcomes or impact among the most vulnerable in your society or in your community, you're not doing equity. And so it really was a focus on those who are falling through the cracks of whatever systems we live in. That's where equity comes in. And if you're not designing for them, then you're not really doing equity. Which goes hand in hand. And then Dr. Thomas described uh, empathy interviews that his students do and that they often did you say the first time they go out, they do something, but then they realize how quite hard it is and have to come back and, and think about how to do it. So and, they're, and they're afraid. When we take our students into black neighborhoods, they come off that beautiful campus and they go into these neighborhoods, just driving there, their heart rates start to increase. And uh, we have to have them get over that because 
the community can smell that fear and get them to a point where they are more honest with themselves. And then they get a story rather than an interview. And they come back with stories. But as I said in our group, we have to let them go out and kind of make mistakes with each other first <laughs> before we put them in the community. <laughs> and it's not easy for them, even among themselves, to be more vulnerable and to be more self-disclosing. In other words, take off the robe of your academic and just be a human. Not easy. It takes practice. Thank you for sharing that. And that's so relevant in the edge, particularly for the education group. Um, and so thank you for that. And I have a quick question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm just curious to know in the different communities there, I know in the United States, there's a lot of issue about building up trust um, in communities, especially minority communities between academia and the hospitals. And then in uh, your partners, uh, your global partners, do they experience the same kind of challenge um, with, with building trust? And then what do you do to address that? And what does it look like? And in Brazil, what's the word for trust or any other country? What is it? What's the word? Yes. What does it sound like? I would love to to answer you, and um, I liked very much what you said before also. And in Brazil, what uh, Dara's methodology is based on a family action plan that is built with a, a multidisciplinary uh, team in contact with the family. And we really believe that it's a co-creation. We can't do anything for them. They have to do it. They have to see it for themselves. Because if we get there and we just say things for them, first, they won't trust us. And just uh, answering Janet also, they won't trust us. They won't believe in what we are saying because you you might have the, the best the best um, you you're, you know, the best intention, but uh, if you're not speaking to their hearts, if you're not connecting, really connecting with them, it won't won't matter for them. So it's important that they feel that they are creating their own path. So. Uh, instead of interviewing, we create with them. We give them the options. We give them uh, roads that they 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 have. They might want to to travel, and it's it's themselves that they have to choose with, with the, which path they are going. Right? It's themselves that have to to understand what they are going to. Where are they going to go? And our 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 are what we have to do in this moment it's i'm sorry it's very difficult to to find the right words in in a in a, in a language that is not mine uh, you are doing but, uh, wonderful you are doing wonderful thank you thank you but our, i think our work uh with them is just fuel them uh um that they feel safe, that they can trust us, that they can really look in our eyes and feel that we want to hear from them and help them. So this is how we measure, how we, we, we resonate trust. This is how we, we try to make this connection, this really strong connection, because it's only when they really trust us, when they look at us and they understand that we are there to help, that they will open their hearts and tell their stories. Because if they don't do that, it, all the all the things that we they, they say to us uh, might be some event, something that they 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 that is not true. I, I think this is very difficult when we you talk about uh, research because when you when you're an NGO and you're there to talk to to people and look in their eyes and so on. Uh, it's easier because you don't in the research you have some you can't transpass some 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 things right you have to really be connected in some words that you have to say and things that you have to do and things that you can or you cannot collect so i think that's very difficult but i think the connection with the other one has to be the first thing that has to be done and and even it's if it's a research they have to understand that that con you're not there for the research you're there for them how do you say trust in portuguese 
confiança. And is it the same translation into English? Or what it, does it have a different yes, meaning? Trust, yes, I trust you, eu confio em você. Uh, uh, conf, uh, tr uh, trust is not the, well, we, we have different uh, words for each person, right? So I, it's confio. If it was he, it would confia. So it's confiança, it's the word. Confiar is the verb. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think you just chose the exact, the perfect words, the connection. And this is really about the connection and, and finding that connection and building on it. Any, any last words before we close out? Do you have barbershops in Brazil? <laughs> I really want to partner with you down there. <laughs> yes, we do. Absolutely. <laughs> Please come. When we can, as soon as we can, right? But um, if no one has anything else, it's three hours is a long time, but this has been very rich with insights and, and um, wonderful experience. And so nice to have our colleagues from Brazil. And I'd really like to thank everyone for their input, um, for sharing their stories. And oh, of course my dog's barking just now um, and sharing their stories and um, trying mural and mostly succeeding at mural. And um, I think that's all part of trust building and working together. And, and um, I'm very proud to be part of this project with um, Dr. Obalu and with the rest of this team and hope that other folks on this call will wanna join us on this journey. And, um, of global learning and um, it's it's been a great three hours and thank you so much. Any last words, Dr. Obalu? No, it's just oh. been wonderful and thank you all for participating. Um, look forward to hearing from the uh, Global Learning Network in the future. Um, we will reach out to you with some additional resources and opportunities to connect with us more. Thank you so much. One last thing. Thank you, <laughs> Janet, North Kabor for everything. Um, you are the MVP um, running the PowerPoint and the mural. So I don't want to leave without saying that. And have a wonderful evening or morning, wherever you are. Um, great to see you all. Bye -bye. Thanks to the organizers. Bye. This was great. Be Thanks, safe. everyone. Thank you. Wear your mask. <laughs> don't play with this. Bye-bye. <laughs>